I'm Rod Sterling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Stanton Forbes' bizarre retrospective tale of entanglement. If two of them are dead. Starring Earl Holland. Catherine Burns. And Nina Foch, his sister Love. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by Quaker State and Ford. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. This week, our story takes place in Midwest America, the Depression years. A lonely farmhouse in which three people come together under desperate circumstances. We are about to meet teenage Dorcas Kimball, her malformed leg a symbol of her bitter life of loneliness and deprivation. Joe John Plunkett, a young hobo, cynical beyond his years, resigned to empty days and nights of aimless wandering. His only goals in life, his next bed, his next meal. And the beautiful evangelist, Sister Magdalene Love, filled with godly zeal and cold, worldly ambition. Three people joined by fate in an old house already occupied by violence and sudden death. Their story, if two of them are dead, begins after this word. Young I may be, but still I'm a man Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can To find me a place where I can be me Get ready for life to free and to see Oh, where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I'm finished with school, but what lies ahead? Don't want to get fast, want to feel free and dead all over the world, there's so much to do. The call of the sea, don't you hear it too? Oh, where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? What about the new Navy? You'll get your chance of success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000 or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. A string of freight cars crossing a dusty stretch of lonely farm. Suddenly, the dark silhouette of a man hurtles in the train, dropping hard into the sharp cinders of the railroad. The man gets to his feet, slaps the dust from his clothes. Finds where his bundle has landed and picks it up. The bundle contains all the man's worldly possessions. An extra shirt, some underwear and socks. A straight-edged razor and a worn leather case. And a small packet of letters addressed to Joe John Plunkett. At this moment, Joe John Plunkett is a hungry man. And a hungry man is ready to do just about anything. To put some food in his belly. It was Plunkett luck, all right. I could see that at a glance. At second glance, anyway. First, when I saw that big tent flapping in the wind in the field across the road, I thought, carnival. Rides and games, work and food. But uh uh. Soul food's what it turned out to be. Soul food for suckers. A revival meeting tent. People with nothing to put in their stomachs must be sitting ducks for some Bible thumper. Well, you deliver me. 
dog. You're a stranger. Everywhere you go, dogs are poor. I'll probably take a hunk out of my own pair of pants. Get oh, away, you little mutt. Tippy? Come on back here, Tippy. Yeah, Tippy. Be a good pooch of ham scray, will you? Tippy? And take her with you. I'm not in the mood for conversation with the farmer's daughter. Or anything else. Especially with some skinny little... I'm sorry about Tippy. But she won't hurt you. She just likes to bark. Little dogs are like that. They think they got to stand up to anything that moves. Yeah, well, I was just moving on. We're walking all the way into town. You're looking for work. Are you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Oh, what do I have to do for it? Something I can see that by the look of her. Edgy and eager. I've seen people who look like that before. They wanted something bad. You any good with a jigsaw? Uh, building things with your hands? I don't plan on settling down here. You see them things over there? Little painted windmills and wooden statues of Uncle Sam? My pa makes them himself, only he took sick. Tuberculosis. He had to go to a sanitarium. I need somebody to make some more. And it's too hard. And and you have a place to sleep and something in your stomach. I don't cook so bad. How old are you? Seventeen. What happened to your leg? Infantile paralysis. But it don't hold me back now. You all alone in the place with your paw gone? That's right. I need somebody to help me. Just for a little while. You don't have to stay long. Who is right? It was crazy taking in a strange tramp off the road. And looking into his face, I could see there was violence in him. Only for a second back there when he asked me about my leg, I felt chills too. And a violent gentle man's just what I need. Anyway, I can't stand being alone no more. With Pa not here. I reckon I ought to know your name. Joe John Plunkett. Mine's Dorcas. Dorcas Kimball. Where are your folks? Dead. And if questions come with this job, forget it. I was just being friendly. Ain't had nobody to talk to all to you for two old days now. Sitting Tippy, of course. Shut up, Tippy. This here's Joe John Plunkett. He's come to help. I cook a meal pretty good, don't I? Well, a man has stars, no judge. Never got no word out of Pa about my cooking either. He was always too liquored up. Where's your mom? Dead a long time. Well, I'll go out and take a look at things in your pa's workshop. See what I can do. You've been to lots of places, I expect. A few. Ever been to Hollywood or New York? Places like that. No. Hollywood's got palm trees and sunshine. All pink and gold is the way I see Hollywood. Yeah. Well, I was never in any pink and gold cities. New York is silver and black velvet. All the cities I've ever seen were the same color. Gray. I'm going out to the workshop. I'll eat you the price of one square mill at least. I guess you've seen the revival meeting tent down the road? I saw it. I don't want you to do no work in my pal's workshop. What do you want me to do? Take me to the revival meeting tonight. I want to see Sister Love. I remember what it said on the sign outside the tent. At tonight's service, there will be a special call for the lame and the halt. It's funny, I'd forgotten about her leg. But I didn't suppose she ever forgot it. Only I didn't see me escorting a cripple to a hallelujah meeting. I'd like to have upchucked the whole damn supper and canceled all debts. Brother, you got into debt so easy, and there was nobody to remind you how hard it is to pay. Nobody. 
I want to see Sister Love. Sister Love? What, a lady of masses? I've seen her picture. She's beautiful. And you think she can make your leg whole again? I didn't say that. You're crippled. You may as well learn to live with it. I am, ain't I? He couldn't hurt me. Didn't matter what he said. I was just so glad he was here. I wasn't alone anymore, just sitting and thinking about everything over and over. I thought about going to the church meeting. I hadn't planned that at all. I just seen the lights gone over at the tent. Seen them when he opened the back door to go out. They put the lights on nearly to attract people. And the thought just came to me like it was printed inside my head. Go to church and ask forgiveness. Morning, Mr. Thompson. Sure is cold this morning. Cold? It must be 94 in the shade. I mean it's cold inside your car's engine. Well, why didn't you say so? You didn't die. Well, just tell me how my engine can be cold on a sweltering day. Glad you asked. When you start a car first thing in the morning, your engine is cold. Well, that's true, but so what? A cold engine does a bad job of burning gas. It can make soot, dirt, and acids form in your motor oil. And they can sure damage an engine. What can I do about it? Glad you asked. Instead of asking for my cheapest oil, you can start using a quality motor oil, Quaker Steak. Nothing finer than Quaker Steak. It's made scientific to neutralize acids and to hold solids suspended so they don't gouge out your engine. Well, thanks for telling me, Caleb. Down the court, Mr. Thompson. Quaker State? Well, yes. Why didn't you give me Quaker State before? You didn't ask. Quaker State, your car. To keep it running young. We'll return to our story in a moment. You're 17. 18. You've graduated from high school. You want to make something of yourself. But you don't have that something to make it with. Like money for four years of college. What do you do? Well, you don't need four years of college to get a good job. Today, there's a crying need for technicians in exciting fields like oceanography, electronic data processing, health service, environmental control, forestry, and many others. Technicians earn twice the salary of the average high school graduate. Some even make more than four-year college graduates. All you need is a year or two of technical training. To learn how you can become a technician, send for our free booklet. It's called 25 Technical Careers. Write Careers, Washington, D.C., 20202. If you can't afford four years of college, write Careers, Washington, D.C., 20202, and make something of yourself. What a strange little girl. Asking a whole lot of questions, often answers I couldn't quite believe. And then when she was saying nothing at all, just staring out from behind those green, green eyes. You think about your pa dying? What? You had a look on your face. He could, you know. Tuberculosis is serious, isn't it? Yes. Only there's something worse than pa dying. That's how he wasted his life. Drinking and ain't up in a place like this. He never got anything from living. How do you know? I know. So, okay. I'm going to take the woodcarver's daughter over to get blessed for the lady evangelist. Well, there wasn't a hell of a lot to ask. The meal wasn't that great, but to a hungry man, it was ambrosia. Ambrosia. There's a word. That's one of my mother's words. How do a woman who use words like ambrosia ever get mixed up with somebody like my old man? <laughs> That's your tough. A real riding bum. Ambrosia was a worthless hunk of language, and a tramp like me was a worthless hunk of humanity. I think my dress is okay. I never thought of the Lord as caring much about what people wore. Anyway, it's the only decent thing I got. Okay, with you, if I wash out my shirt. Sure, you can hang it on the clothesline out and back. There's clothespins in the bag. I'll wear my good spare. I don't figure the Lord is fussy, but maybe your sister love is. What does 
hard to believe. A deserted town I'd seen earlier was now alive with humanity. There was even a string of cars and trucks backed up along the road. The headlights formed an arrow pointing the way to sister love and salvation. Every night I watched them come. So many people. There'll be some places down in front. If you want a place to sit, you better get inside. Come on, people are always strange about sitting in the first row. Oh, you want to see her good, don't you? Come on. Welcome, Mrs. Delano. Thank you. Read your pamphlet. It tells you all about the legend of Sister Magdalene Love. Yeah, I'll wait and see her for myself. Looking around, I thought I was already seeing her. That old lady with the faded blue eyes waving a paper fan into her flushed face. And the young man stumbling down the aisle on crutches. And the women in wheelchairs and the men hobbling on canes and all the others. <laughs> yeah, they were the lame and the halt. Broken in body and twisted in soul. The large illuminated cross above the stage had just come on. A double line of young women in purple dresses and solemn-faced young men in shiny white suits and purple bow ties filed under it in precise formation. I, I had the feeling the monster show was about to begin when a white-bearded man in a white satin tuxedo made his entrance. He looked like the interlocutor. Look, there's Brother Love. It says in the pamphlet, he's her uncle. Both her parents were killed in the bus wreck down in Tennessee, and Sister Love prophesied it before it happened. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sister Love welcomes you. And let us return her welcoming prayer. The prayer that will shake the heavens. Let us pray. And now, our brothers and sisters, I hear. Oh, yes, I hear. Sister Love is coming. Enter, Sister Love. Love, enter. While we are held in thine embrace, there's not a thought attempts to roam. Each smile upon thy beauteous face fixes and charms and fires our love. So that was Sister Magdalene Love. A face like carved ivory. Violet eyes. And red gold hair like a halo of flame around her head. Standing tall and queen-like in a flowing purple robe. But you know, it was the expression in her face that held you. Now that was a look you knew you'd never forget. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Lord, how secure and blessed are they who feel the joys of pardon sin. Should storms of wrath shake earth and sea, their minds have heaven and peace within. Amen. 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 and Amen. and Amen. 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 Their nightly minutes gently move. Amen. While they're wretched, like worms and moles lie groveling in the dust below. As you know, we have been in this place of Sodom and Gomorrah for five nights now. And each evening we welcome more lost sheep back into the fold. Even Dorcas lifted her head and turned around sharply. The man was sitting across the aisle in the road just behind us. He was big and rough-looking, unshaven, and plainly drunk. Oh, Sister Love was staring down at him. The look in her eyes seemed to grow softer instead of harder. You are troubled, dear brother. Yes, Look, Sister Love's coming down off the stage. Walking like a queen, Magdalene Love came down that aisle toward that heckler. The big man staggered to his feet. Let me help you, brother. And that's when it happened. As Sister Love reached out to the man, he drew back his arm to hit her. Now, I was sure he was going to hit her, and that's why I did it. I bolted from my seat, I shoved Sister Love out of the way, and I sent that drunk crash into the board of the pilot. No! No! As soon as I did it, I knew I'd made a mistake. Oh, boy, a bad mistake. When you're a stranger in a place, there's one rule to remember. 
never do anything to call attention to your show. It always means trouble. And right about then, I knew I'd gotten me some, some big trouble. Looking for a car that's easy on gas, easy to buy, and yet has the luxury you want in a car? Look what we've done to our Mustang. Look what we've done to that car. Oh, we changed the size, we changed the style, and drove by the light you find. So look what we've done to that car. Mustang 2, it's the all-new economical car from Ford. The right car at the right time, built even smaller than the original Mustang. It has an easy-on-the-gas four-cylinder engine, rack and pinion steering, tachometer, four-speed transmission, plus a beautifully appointed interior, all standard. Luxury plus economy, that's Mustang 2. When you take the ride, you're Mustang 2, $28.95, excluding dealer prep, destination charges, title, and taxes. See your local Ford dealer. The Zero Hour continues after this. Where does today's girl learn to be tomorrow's woman? At the movies? On television? Helen, darling, your floors are so shiny. Yes, John. I used Brand X polish just this morning. Brand X. Helen, will you marry me? Somewhere between the super sex symbol of today's commercialism and TV's Brand X image, impending womanhood is alive and well. And where is that somewhere? Wherever there are campfire girls. <laughs> reaches the girl reaching out for tomorrow and puts a promise before her, the promise of personal development, of friends and fun, the promise of womanhood. Campfire takes today's girl to tomorrow. I was right about the violence in Joe John. Well, he jumped up and plugged that man. It don't happen so fast. Joe Jones, are you all right? Just sit back down, Dorcas. Everything's okay. It's a bad habit of mine. But anyway, I got no business. Look, he's taking that man away. He's as liquid up as my pa ever was. Now, now, everything is all right, brothers and sisters. Now, just return to your seats and let us pray for that unfortunate sin. Now, those of you whose bodies are tortured and maimed, but who wish to cleanse and purify your souls, come forward that Sister Love may lay her hands upon you and give you the healing of her blessing. He sons of men of feeble race, Exposed to every snare, come make the Lord your dwelling place and try and trust his care. This is what you came here for, isn't it? Aren't you going up there? No. Then come on, let's get out of here. Ah, there you are, boy. I've been waiting for you. It was that fat deputy who'd taken the drunk away. Well, I knew I was in trouble. Every time I move, I'm in trouble. Hey, what's your name, boy? Joe John Plunkett. And where do you live? We live just up the road. Oh, you, uh, related? We're cousins. First cousins. Joe John just came to stay a while with me and my pa. You're pretty good with your fists, ain't you, Joe John? Uh, <clears throat> no, not so good. I just took him by surprise. You know, he was drunk. I thought he was going to hit her. I want to thank you, brother. She came out of the shadows behind us with a burning halo around her head. Her voice thanking me sounded soft and sincere. Only I, I caught a glint of something else in those violet eyes of hers. Something that told me she hated my guts for what I'd just done. Hush up, people. Show me up. No way the deputy can find out I was lying, even if he comes around asking more questions. He might get to wondering where your pa is. Well, I just explained to him about the sanitarium, that's all. 
And what if he decided to check up on that? He won't. Besides, Sister Love told him to leave you be. And you heard her. She even sent Brother Love to get that drunk out of jail. Yeah. Sister Love seems to be overflowing with Brother Love, all right. So you can stay here as long as you want now, and you won't get in any trouble. Well, I can use a good night's sleep. I'll go there for her. I was just thinking, maybe you'd like something to drink first. There's some of my pa's homebrew. It's in the cyclone cellar. Well, I could use a drink for sure. I'll get you the flashlight. I was still trying to figure Dorcas Kimball out. Now, whatever it was she wanted out of me, she was still leading up to it. Here, you can go down and bring up as much as you want. I sure didn't need that flashlight outside. The moon was full and the stars looked like they went on forever. I crossed the yard to the cellar door. It was so heavy, I wonder how dark as ever managed to open it. See, the cellar was dark. I turned on the flashlight and started down. And then I saw what Dorcas Kimball had sent me down here to find. The dead body of her paw. You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. I was in South Korea with the Peace Corps. We were the first rural health program in Korea. Uh, what a lot of us did was to go around and check to see if there was a TB patient in the house. A lot of these people had never, ever had any kind of medical attention at all. I, I, I remember um, one case, she was in pain, she was in real pain, and a doctor examined her and became very concerned. And he told us later that had she not come in, she would have died. I was very, very proud. <laughs> You know, but um, you, you've probably heard this and you'll hear it again and again from volunteers. The volunteer himself gets more out of it than he actually gives to, to the people who's supposed to be helping. Volunteer for the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps is one part of action. Action is doing something. There is something you can do. Get into action. Get into... Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau. Spring and summer are the seasons when most people plan vacations and they go flying off all over the place. And, of course, they bring back a peck of precious pictures. Many camera stores are beginning to paste notices to their counters warning people that airline security measures may ruin photographic film in checked baggage. Some anti-hijacking devices used to check baggage for possible concealed weapons utilize x-rays, which will fog your film whether or not it's been exposed. Therefore, one of the best ways to protect film while traveling is to place it in a strong, clear plastic bag and hand carry it. Even though the film may be clearly visible in the bag, make sure that the airline boarding personnel are aware of the film so that it isn't accidentally subjected to x-rays. This has been a consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense. If two of them are dead, I'm Rod Serling. Brought to you in part by Quaker State and Four. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking.
Tune in tomorrow. And once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Stanton Forbes' bizarre retrospective tale of entanglement. If two of them are dead. Starring Earl Holland. Burns. And Nina Foch as Sister Love. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by. Eastman Kodak Company and Quaker State Motor Oil. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. The Depression years. A time of transience. A time when home was anywhere one spent the night. For Joe John Plunkett, home was a moving freight rolling across the American Midwest, where it was until he met Dorcas Kimball, 17, crippled and alone, two young misfits in a ramshackle house, and a revival meeting just down the road. Nothing surprising for the time and place. But for Joe John Plunkett and Dorcas Kimball, the quest for salvation was destined to be a surprisingly dangerous proposition. If two of them are dead, we'll continue in a moment. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can. Find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life to free and see. Oh, where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I'm finished with you. One line ahead, don't want to get fast, want to feel free and dead. All over the world, there's so much to do. The call of the sea, don't you hear it too? Oh, where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? What about the new Navy? You'll get your chance of success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000 or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. I know I'm not going from here. The body lay crumpled at the foot of the cellar stairs. Oh, I knew right away it was Dorcas's paw. And she'd sent me down here on purpose to find it. You must have seen Paul lying there dead by now. He'd be coming back any minute. Well, what else was I going to do? I couldn't just say right out, there's a dead body in the cellar and I don't know what to do about it. I had to get help somehow. And Joe John Plunkett coming up the road with Tippy yapping at his heels, he seemed to be it. I was just going to have to get Joe John to help me, whether he wanted to or not. That's some bad case of tuberculosis your pa has got. Guess you need to see your son lying there. It was my pa. It doesn't matter who he is anymore. It's my pa, all right. What happened? I reckon I killed him. Didn't mean to. Well, <clears throat> thanks for the meal. I'll get along without the bed. You go, and I guess I'll have to set that deputy on you. I'll have to explain how you aren't my cousin at all, how you came around begging for work. And my pa took you on because he wasn't feeling well. And you killed him. 
uh, what am I supposed to have killed him for? The striving trade you're doing in wooden statues of Uncle Sam? There's money hidden in the cellar. It's mine. But I'll say you found out and killed Pa for it. Well, you sucked me in good, didn't you? What are we going to do with him? You can't just dig a hole in the ground and throw him in like a dead horse. You think you can get away with this? There ain't nobody who's going to miss him. Well, you must have been one hell of a daughter. I hated him. I didn't mean for him to die. I wanted to go to Sister Love's meeting to pray. I asked for forgiveness. But I didn't feel nothing, nothing at all. Well, you managed to get me into your trap real good with that Sister Love business. That deputy's already got me pegged to somebody who hits first and thinks about it later. I had nothing to do with that. You did that yourself. But I could have still used the same story since you're just a stranger here. Yeah, well, when you're a stranger, you got no chance at all, all right. Everybody's against you right off. So what are we going to do with it? My pa's body, I mean. What do you mean? There's nobody to miss him. I mean, you got no kin folks at all? There's just pa and me, that's all. Ever since ma died. What about your neighbors? Oh, Mrs. Buttleford down the road is all. She never comes near our place no more. She hated my pa. Called him a whiskey-breathing devil. If she thinks anything at all, she'll just figure he finally drunk himself to death. Well, what about some old friend of your pa's that might show up? If there was any, they'd think the same thing. I, pa didn't have no friends, only somebody to get drunk with now and then. He doesn't know anybody any money, does he? Nobody give Pa credit. How about the people that come here to buy these statues and things? I mean, you got any steady customers? Nobody ever comes more than once. Anyway, I always wait on the people who come. Pa stayed in his workshop. Yeah, well... There's somebody you haven't even thought of. This isn't a game. Who is it? The census taker. Only he don't come but every ten years, and he was just here a while back. All right. Give me a shovel. Let's get it over with. I want to change my clothes first. If I did it in this dress, I couldn't ever wear it again. And so when I got. Well, go ahead, but let's hurry up, will you? We can bury him right there in the cellar. It's got a dirt floor. It'd be kind of like one of them mausoleums. You know, like they have in cemeteries. Of course, I can't put up a tombstone or anything like that. Maybe I can plant some flowers by the cellar door. I really couldn't figure her out. She just killed her father somehow, and now she was worrying about planting flowers by his grave. Just then, she sounded like a scared little girl. Maybe that's all she was, all she'd ever been. Let's go. I'm ready now. Brought along this old quilt to wrap him up in. Make it easier to handle him, I figure. Well, I figured that was one weird manner of figuring. First, she kills her old man, leaves him lying there for who knows how long. Then she wants to wrap him up like some kind of a birthday present. I figured it was bad luck and big troubles. Joe John Plunkett style. That wasn't daisies we were planting. If I went ahead with this thing, I'd be taking part in what amounted to murder. Looking for a car that's easy on gas, easy to buy, and yet has the luxury you want in a car? Look what we've done to our Mustang. Look what we've done to that car. Well, we change the size, we change the size, and you're going to like it fine. So look what we've done to that car. Mustang 2. It's the all-new economical car from Ford. The right car at the right time. Built even smaller than the original Mustang. It has an easy on the gas four-cylinder engine, rack and pinion steering, tachometer, four-speed transmission, plus a beautifully appointed interior. All standard. Luxury plus economy. That's Mustang 2. When you take a ride, you're going to go back Mustang 2, $28.95, excluding dealer prep, destination charges, title, and taxes. See your local Ford dealer. We'll return to our story in a moment. When they change a plane flight, I check to see if another is just as good or better. 
Fred Underwood, Kansas City postal worker, probably knows as much about airline schedules as the airlines. I want to give that extra service that goes with airmail. So I move it just as fast as I can to get it out of here. And airmail is moving. Now you can almost always get next day delivery to cities up to 600 miles away. And two day delivery anywhere in the country. Just mail by 4 p.m., use zip code, and mail from a specially marked airmail box. When I started here, it was all propeller planes and trains. And back in the post office, the mail was handled the same way it had been for years. Now there's jet planes and zip codes, and airmail's really going places. Airmail and zip codes. They speed everybody's letters. If you don't know a zip code, check your phone book or call the post office. Help us help you. Use zip code. Well, I thought it over whether or not to help her out. I sure didn't feature getting mixed up in a murder. But I decided it was something I had to do. Now a dead man's got to be buried. His body isn't stiff. I thought it would be. Does it get stiff like I've read about? And then get soft again before it starts to rot away? Oh, you shut up. I'm just nervous, that's all. Looks plenty deep to me. Yeah, well, the deeper the better. Ain't nobody ever come down here but Pa and me. And I won't ever want to come down again, knowing I'd be walking on Pa's grave. Just shut up and let me dig in peace, will you? Okay, I'll shut up. I had something else to think about anyway. The money. I hadn't been lying about that. I did have money hidden in the cellar. I could look at a place on the wall and know just which brick it was that was loose and had the money hid behind it. I couldn't let my pa find that money. He'd have spent every cent of it on liquor and I wouldn't have had nothing left. Nothing in the world. My great aunt Nadine had given me that money when she was dying. Come here, girl. Don't be afraid. How are you feeling, great aunt Nadine? Uh, I'm dying. Cancer. Eating me up. I remember now how the room had smelled like slow death. My pillow reach under my bed. And I pulled out a little beaded purse and seen what was inside. Shiny gold pieces. Three hundred dollars worth turned out. Now, d don't let your pa... They've been Great Aunt Nadine's last words. Okay. You don't have to give me a hand with him. What? Just help me get him under this quilt. Then we can just slide him into the hole. All right. No, I'll handle his head and shoulders. You just lift up his legs. Okay. Now, help me ease him down. There. It's done. The worst of it's done. You're not going to start crying for him now, are you? Uh, I'm crying for him. It's my leg. It's hurting and you hurt me for a long time now. All that's left now was just to come up that open dance, and I did that fast enough. And I remember that home who I come down for in the first place. Before we went back into the house, I made sure I had a couple of bottles of it under my arm. Only first, as soon as I got back into that kitchen, I filled the sink with water and stood there for a long time, washing my hands. You want me to fix you something more to eat? No, I think I'll just try some of your Paul's medicine. Then I guess I'll go to bed. I've never felt so tired. Yes, yeah, it's been a long day. Good night, Joe Joan. Thank you. I couldn't remember going to bed or falling asleep, and I had no idea what time it was the next day when I finally woke up. I only knew that I woke with just one thought. I hoped Joe John Plunkett was gone. Gone for good. I didn't need him anymore. I didn't need anybody. Anybody here? Sorry, 
to keep you waiting. Hush, Tippy. Oh. Uh, well, forgive me, dear. I, I, I wouldn't have acted so impatient if I'd known you were handicapped. I was just changing my clothes, that's all. And I thought somebody else was here to answer the door. Now, my husband and I were admiring that large statue of Uncle Sam you have out there in the yard. Uh, how much are you asking for it? Large Uncle Sam's two dollars. Forget it, Marie. But see, he's a little faded. I'll let you have him for a dollar and a half. Oh, well, what do you think, George? Jim cracks. They're all worthless, if you ask me. Now, George, Hetty Burns has got a little wooden statue sitting in the middle of her petunia bed. Looks real smart. Mm. Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, we'll uh, take him off your hands for a dollar. Well, that's uh, giving it away. But all right, it's too hot to argue. <laughs> Pay her, George. Get it in the car. I want to get some place for a frosted root beer for a melt. Thanks, mister. Don't thank me. You should have held off with a buck and a half. Thought you'd taken off for tall timber by now. I could have had some breakfast coming. Don't worry, I'm going. Picked up a mess of eggs. Yeah, I'll do them. I already put the coffee pot on. Where are you heading? Just as far away as I can get. Me too, as soon as I can. The money you got hidden in the cellar. I imagine you could go ways on that. Hmm, you ain't forgot about that. Nobody forgets to mention the money. Look, you don't have to fret about me. I mean, I don't figure it's enough to walk over anybody's grave for. That money's mine. It's got nothing to do with Pa. Of course, you'll have to go back down there to get your money. Though you did say you'd never go there again, didn't you? I said I won't ever want to. Well, I'll just have to, one more time. Is that why you killed him? Because of the money? You couldn't understand. You didn't know him, what he was like. How it was to be stuck here all alone with him, never knowing what he was going to do next. <laughs> You hear me calling you, girl? I know you were down here. I seen you split across the yard and your skirts flying. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, girl. Getting too old to be running around showing yourself the way you do. You got that bad leg, but there ain't nothing wrong with the rest of you. You better watch yourself or you're going to wind up in bad trouble. You leave me alone. Hey! Ain't no way to talk to me. I'm your pa, remember? Leave me be, pa. Now, now, girl. I ain't going to... Not... Get away from me, pa. I'm warning you. Oh, it was so bad when you just get away from us. Huh? You could have gone to the cops if your pa was mistreating you. I thought of doing that. One was. But I couldn't. Couldn't have my own pa put in jail. <laughs> so, you, so you just killed him instead, huh? My heart bleeds for you. You want more coffee? No, I'd settle for a cigarette, though, if you had one. Then I'm going to hop the next freight out of here. There's some bull in the cupboard if you can roll. I can do anything when I have to. You all know that. Well, you just know it. Here comes trouble, huh? We got company. Your favorite sister just turned off the highway. I don't have no sister. Oh, yes, you do. She rides around in a big black hupmobile. You mean... Yeah, I mean, Sister Love. And she's coming this way. Judy, do you remember what I told you about all that high-speed turnpike driving you're doing now and all that power equipment on your new car? Yes, Caleb. About how they can make your engine so hot that the oil thins down so it may not protect your engine? Yes, Caleb. Now, how do you tell if your oil's too hot? Just watch the temperature gauge. Nope. That just shows how hot the radiator fluid is. 
Oh, I know. When the oil's too hot, that little red light goes on. Nope. That just tells you the oil pressure's too low. Well, how do I tell if my oil's too hot? Fact is, you can't. Then how do I know my engine's protected? Make sure you're using quality oil, like Quaker State. Quaker State specially made to stand up to high engine heat so it can keep right on protecting like an oil's supposed to. Is that the reason you always recommend Quaker State? That's one reason. Quaker State, your car, to keep it running young. The Zero Hour continues after this. The best pollution-fighting machine in America is right at your fingertips. And that means pointing out pollution whenever and wherever you see it. Like that smokestack you pass every morning that's always spewing smoke into the air. Don't close your eyes to it. Take a stand. Point it out to someone who can do something about it. It'll make you feel a little better and America look a little cleaner. People start pollution. People can stop it. This message brought to you on behalf of Keep America Beautiful and the Advertising Council. Uh, whatever Sister Love was here for, I was sure it wanted to thank me. She said her thank you last night. And I still remember that look of resentment in her eyes when she said it. Good afternoon, my child. She looked different than the way she looked under the lights in the tent. She was younger than I thought, but still not really young. Older than Joe John, I reckon. And she looked more real. Not like a queen anymore. She had on a fancy dress, a lot of ruffles and ribbons. May I come in? I reckon you came to see Joe John. He's in the kitchen. Could I wait in the parlor while you get him? Oh, sure. You sit there on the davenport. I'll go tell him. Bless you, my child. So what does she want? To see you, just like her sister. She's waiting in the parlor. Yeah, well, you just let her wait. I'm going to finish my cigarette in peace first. I suppose I, I ought to offer some tea or something. <laughs> How about some of your pa's homebrew? Well, that's not as funny as you think. You've seen the way she's dressed? Well, you don't expect her to go around in that purple preacher's robe all the time, do you? Never mind. You just get in there and find out what she wants. Why don't you? I'll bring the tea. As you can understand, Mr. Plunkett, traveling around the country as I do, incidents such as last night's are bound to occur from time to time. Of course I don't like to have such unfortunate souls as that poor man arrested and placed in jail on my account. In fact, I had Brother Love go right into town and put up bail so he could be free to go on his way. Yeah, you sure that was smart? Uh, he could come back and make trouble for you. Exactly. Ironic as it may seem, people do not always appreciate being saved. Indeed, they sometimes resent me for trying. Now, I can understand that, all right. Oh, and that's why I've come to ask you to help me, Joe John Plunkett. Me? What is it that you want Joe John to do? Goodness, child. I thought you'd gone off someplace. I fixed you some tea. That's very kind of you. But if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to Mr. Plunkett privately. This is my house, not his. She's right, you know. This is her house. I kind of like to hear the answer to that question she just asked you. Seems I never know what people are likely to ask me to do next. We will be leaving directly after the services tonight. And I want you to come with us. As my bodyguard. Your bodyguard? Twenty dollars a week. And your room and board. He can't. Judge John's working for me. He's going to run the jigsaw. I'm going to pay him twenty-five dollars a week. You're staying here, aren't you, Judge John? Well, if the money's not enough, Mr. Plunkett, I... No, I, uh... No, the money's okay. It's more than I'm worth. No, thanks. You have other fish to fry? 
It ain't like that between Joe John and me. It ain't like that at all. Oh, child. I must have been insinuating you. No, I, uh, look, what I don't see is why you're so set on me joining up with you. I mean, that don't make sense. I'm a bum. I mean, don't you know a bum when you see one? You don't have to be a bum. Oh, yes, I do. I have to be. I mean, I'm made for it. I work at it. Some people work for success. I work at being a failure. There are people like that, you know. Sit down, Joe John Plunkett. Look, don't think you're going to try to convert me. Sit down, I said. As a matter of fact, I was only testing you. Testing me? I wanted to see what you were made of. In my profession, as you know, I deal with a lot of weak people. You mean cripples? Mental cripples. People who come to me begging for help. People who could help themselves, but they won't. They come to me looking for the easy way, something magic and quick. But uh, to help people, no matter what, isn't that wonderful? Of course it's wonderful, child. That's my purpose in life, my burden and my joy. But it hasn't come easy. I've worked hard, striven ceaselessly toward my goal, to reach as many people as I can. And now I need help. Help that I can't get from a weak man. I need your help, Joe John Puckett. And yours too, child. What's your name? Uh, Dorcas, Dorcas Kimball. But you said this was your house? I is there anyone else living here besides you? No, nobody else except for Joe John. Why? Why? Because this place is perfect for what I have in mind. Oh, <laughs> now, finally we cut bait, huh? I have a mission. I can do good in this world that no one else can do. I have a message that is the power and the glory, and I must be heard by everyone. And I've chosen the two of you to aid me in my mission. Well, how? What do you want us to do? I want you to kidnap me. You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. When the SS hope drops anchor, crowds gather to welcome her. For all over the world, people have heard of this famous hospital ship. They've heard about patients being healed. They've heard of doctors and nurses who have learned new medical skills from the staff of Project Hope. But most of all, they've heard about the people of Project Hope. People who are willing to leave their own land and go to a remote country to do what their hearts tell them must be done. To work seven days a week in unfamiliar surroundings with limited equipment. The people of Project Hope spend part of their time on shore with the people of every country they visit. They teach and they learn. They leave behind a vast store of medical knowledge and they bring back a better understanding of the people they've served. Help Hope live on. Send your contribution to Project Hope, Room A, Washington, D.C. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful forest where everything was all lovely and green and peaceful. Sunlight fell in ribbons of daylight through its trees. Birds flew in a quiet air above it. Deer and rabbits found secret hiding places to play. For it was truly a beautiful place. And then one day, into this beautiful emerald forest, a new creature came. A creature called man. A man brought with him fire to warm him against the night. Only with his fire, man did not bring caution and the fire got away from him suddenly. And the beautiful forest was no more. And yet there might easily be a different ending. For if man is careful with his fire, he need never say, once upon a time, there was a beautiful forest. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense. If two of them are dead, I'm Rod Serling. Today's episode brought to you in part by Eastman Kodak Company and Quaker State Motor Oil. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System 
in association with Hollywood Radio Theater, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Stanton Forbes' bizarre retrospective tale of entanglement. If two of them were dead. Starring Earl Howe. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by Quaker State Motor Oil and Contact. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. of the Depression. Three people sit in the parlor of a lonely Midwestern farmhouse. Joe John Plunkett, 24 hours off a passing freight train. Dorcas Kimball, whose father, Joe John, has just helped to bury in the cyclone cellar. And Sister Magdalene Love, the beautiful evangelist, who has come to Joe John and Dorcas with a strange proposition. If two of them are dead, continues after this word... Hi, I'm Pinocchio, the big nose and all that, you know. But seriously, lots of kids don't know about me. How can kids read if they don't have any books? And millions of kids, black, white, red, yellow, brown, all races, live in homes without any books. Getting books into the hands of these girls and boys is what the national program, WIF, Reading is Fundamental, is all about. Here's what WIF has found out. When kids choose the books they want because the subjects interest them and they own the book, that makes reading fun. And when reading is fun, it's just fundamental. Books widen a kid's world, and their abilities, and their whole life. Every community needs RIF. Find out what you and RIF can do in your community. Just like RIF, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C., 20560. That's RIF, R-I-F, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C., 20560. Right now. If America's to go out thinking, reading is fundamental. Well, I've been riding freights most of my grown life, although I wasn't really that old. And I had my share of close scrapes and run-ins. It got to be where I could sense when something bad was going to happen to me. So all I could figure out was I must have taken a pretty fair blow to the head when I jumped off that last freight. Because if I'd had any sense at all, I'd have been long gone from here by now. I mean, first, getting took in by a cripple kid who talks me into escort into some holy roller shindig, then getting half-tricked into burying her father, who she killed, and then sitting in the parlor drinking tea with her and a lunatic lady evangelist who had just about the craziest notion I'd ever heard of in all my life. I want you to kidnap me. Kidnap you? I'll pay the two of you $1,000 to keep me here in this house for two weeks. Here in my house? It's perfect. No one would suspect that Sister Love was being held a prisoner in such an ordinary, nondescript place as this. Well, you, you, you're nuts. You know, I always figured anybody in the line of work you're in had to be. <laughs> you are both responding just as I anticipated you would. 
It is only out of your initial surprise at the idea. Neither of you were shocked. I counted on that. Well, if you want to know the truth, Joe, John Plunkett, you owe me this. Oh, yeah. Well, all of a sudden, seems like I owe everybody something. That little scene with that drunk last night? For your information, that had been carefully planned and was being beautifully executed until you interfered. Well, that figures. I should have known better. The man you struck was Clay Turner. He come to me a poor sinner, bereft of his family, his job, everything, because of demon rum. We prayed together several times. I drove the devil from his soul. He was very grateful. The perfect pigeon, huh? A poor sinner you were going to make into a rich sinner. What I'm planning to do will harm no one. And it will enable me to help hundreds, no, thousands of poor souls that otherwise I might never reach. But how will kidnapping you do that? By bringing greater fame to the name of Sister Love. So that I may carry the word throughout the length and breadth of this land. From New York to California. Really? And if you and Joe John do as I say, you'll both be able to travel wherever you wish. Yeah, well, I already do. I mean in style. You know, what about this uh, Clay Turner? Oh, uh, you took care of him. And I had Brother Love give him a hundred dollars for his trouble. Yeah, Brother Love. Now, what does he think about this mad scheme of yours? Oh, Brother Love does whatever I say. For instance, at the moment, he's waiting outside in that hot, hot car. Although I've no doubt he's enjoying a peaceful afternoon nap. He's my Uncle Micah, you know. An obliging, harmless old man. Is it true what he says in the pamphlet? Did you predict that your mind and power were going to be killed the way they were? I did. Although I'll confess to you, it was a safe enough prediction. Bessie and Abner Love, my mother and father, carried the gospel message over the most dangerous kind of mountain terrain. And they never spent a nickel on the pairs for that old bus of theirs. Poor noble souls. They sound as crazy as you do. There's nothing crazy about what I'm proposing. I have it all worked out. We leave for Chinoo tonight right after the service. You would follow me there in a car. Yeah, well, now there's a snag right there. What car? Never mind about that right now. I'd slip out in the middle of the night and meet you, and then we'd return here. As simple as that. Mm-hmm. I'd leave the ransom note and arrange the scene before I left. Oh, very neat. Then, in about two weeks, I, I think it should be, You'd be free of me and a thousand dollars richer. But how are you going to get rescued? Oh, or are you just rescue yourself? And if you're kidnapped, now there's supposed to be ransom money. What, what about that? Well, the ransom should be sizable. Fifty thousand dollars sounds right, don't you think? Well, the amount doesn't matter because it'll never be paid. No, the ransom note will state that instructions will follow, but they won't. The three of us will just sit here and wait until the two weeks are up. Yeah, that sounds cozy. Then you and, and Dorcas here can do whatever you wish. I'll tell the authorities the kidnappers got frightened and ran away. And, of course, my description of my abductors will be constructed purely out of my imagination. We'd hope. What about the car we need? Where are we going to get it? Well, Joe John would have to buy a car under his name. You could keep it to go away in, Joe John. Now, just think how free you would be with your own car. Mm -hmm. Well, listen to me. Hopping freight suits me just fine. And now that I've heard this whole scheme of yours, I, I think you're crazier than I even thought of first. And listen, Dorcas Kimball, if you've got any sense at all, you'll get this mad woman out of your house right now. Don't you worry, Sister Love. I'll talk to him. You'd be surprised at the things I can get Joe John Plunkett to do. There's nothing on this earth that surprises me, my child. And as for my worrying, remember, I have faith. Morning, Mr. Thompson. Sure is cold this morning. Cold? It must be 94 in the shade. I mean it's cold inside your car's engine. Well, why didn't you say so? You didn't ask. Well, just tell me how my engine can be cold on a sweltering day. Glad you asked. 
When you start a car first thing in the morning, your engine is cold. Well, that's true, but so what? A cold engine does a bad job of burning gas. It can make soot, dirt, and acids form in your motor oil. And they can sure damage an engine. What can I do about it? Glad you asked. Instead of asking for my cheapest oil, you can start using a quality motor oil. Quaker State. Nothing finer than Quaker State. It's made scientific to neutralize acids and hold solids suspended. So they don't gouge out your engine. Well, thanks for telling me, Caleb. Down a quart, Mr. Thompson. Quaker State? Well, yes. Why didn't you give me Quaker State before? You didn't ask. Quaker State, your car. To keep it running young. We'll return to our story in a moment. We weren't able to use the gutter you had there, so that cost you 73 bucks extra. And I got to charge you 870 bucks for the petition your wife wanted... And 490 to tear it down after she changed her mind. Uh, seven additional outlets, 350 bucks. The doorknob you chose was a special order. That cost 47 clams. I had to repaint the rear wall. Your wife didn't like the color. 241 bucks. Uh, bathroom fixtures cost 3,450 instead of the 42 we budgeted. The plumber's bill was $1,675. Don't begin a repair job on your home before you understand all the costs involved. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has a booklet entitled Fixing Up Your Home or a free copy write to HUD, Washington, D.C., 20410 or call your local FHA-approved lender. ...cash advances to subcontractors, so the total comes to about $83,000. Mr. Smith, are you all right? Mr. Smith? Well, this was a chance for me to get away. To really go to those places I've been dreaming about all my life. Great Aunt Nadine's money plus my half of a thousand dollars make me good as rich. But you're as crazy as she is. Hell, I'd be spending two weeks with two cuckoos in a cuckoo nest. For five hundred dollars and a new car? Yeah, well, it wouldn't be worth it. No, if I did decide to go along with it, it wouldn't be for the money. Well, what would it be for then? Uh, because it would be something to do. A gamble. With the stakes against me. You wouldn't understand. Well, you don't understand me either. But that doesn't matter, as long as we both have our reasons. Yeah, she was right there. We were a couple of misfits, Dorcas Kimball and me. Sister Love knew what she was doing. She couldn't have chosen two more likely sinners to do her dirty work... We both had nothing to lose. Ah, uh, you decided then. You're going to do it. Well, it depends. I mean, I don't like that part at the end where we drive off into the sunset and you tell your little fairy tale. Joe John's got a better idea. Yeah, your uncle's going to have to face the police and the newspapers with the ransom note, you know? Oh, there's no problem. I'll simply tell him to be very upset about it. But to say or pay nothing. No, no, no. You just, uh, you tell him to pay it. That is, to pretend to pay it. He can leave a dummy package, which we'll pick up, and then we'll set you free. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, it will make more publicity for the newspapers. I agree. Anything else? Yeah. A letter from you stating that this whole thing was your idea. And we'll also have the dummy package as evidence. So it's just a couple of little security measures. All right. But there's no reason why you shouldn't trust me. No, there's no reason why we should. It was exciting. Just like in the movies. We had to postpone the plan for a few days. Till Joe John bought the car. Then I addressed a letter to Sister Love. Care of General Delivery in Chinook. The letter was in code to let her know we were ready. And all it said was, Jesus saves. About time you came. I wasn't enjoying waiting out here in the middle of nowhere at this hour of night. You, you wouldn't have liked me to get a speeding ticket on the way, would you? Uh, how you like your new car? It serves the purpose. Did you leave the ransom note? Of course. Fifty thousand dollars or sister love will be sent to heaven. <laughs> Newspapers will like that. 
I can hardly wait to see the headlines tomorrow. Neither can Dorcas. She thinks this whole thing is a game. Yeah, poor child. Probably starved for a little excitement in her life. Hmm. This is a strange child. How old is she? Seventeen. Seems younger than that to me. It's odd. A young girl like that living all alone in that house. Until you came, of course. Both of her parents are dead, I gather. That's right. Are you related to her on her mother's side or her father's? What? I heard you tell the deputy you were cousins. First cousins. Yeah, that's right. On her mother's side. What about your folks? They still living? My old man fell off an oil rig. Killed himself instantly. Oh, it's terrible. What about your mother? What is this, some kind of third degree? I was only being friendly. After all, we're going to be living together for two whole weeks. We may as well get to know each other. Yeah, well, you know enough already. Only that your father's dead. And that you come from a better background than you try to make out. What makes you think that? What is one of my stocks in trade? Finding out about people from what they say and the way they say it. I've worked hard to get rid of that Tennessee twang I used to have. <laughs> you can't have an accent in my business. People they have too many prejudices. Yeah, well, I know about people. You don't have to tell me about them. Look, I'll travel in my business, too, you know? Yeah, being a failure, a bum. That's right. If your mother is still living, what does she think about it? Look, I didn't say she was still living. Look, look, I didn't say anything about it at all. Oh, forgive me, Joe John. I didn't know your mother was a subject you didn't wish to discuss. Well, you, you just asked too many questions, that's all. <laughs> that's another of my stocks in trade. But it's late. I'm too tired for any more talk. Yeah, I think I'll go lie back and try to sleep the rest of the way. Yeah, well, that'll be just fine with me. She sure likes her rest, don't you? The longer she stays up in her room, the better I like it. Well, she probably doesn't want to be seen in those house dresses she had me buy. They're real plain, no ruffles and ribbons. You know, I got a feeling she'll still look okay. Yeah, I suppose so. With that face and that hair, and the way she walks. <laughs> her stock's in trade. Huh? Oh, nothing. Anyway, she'll be down soon. She's going to want to see this newspaper. Oh, that must be her coming now. Oh, hush, Tiffany. Tiffany won't stop barking at her. Dogs are smart. Did it come yet? The newspaper. Is it here? It's here. Am I in it? You're in it. On the front page. Really? Well, where? I don't see it. Down at the bottom. Yeah, I guess that Bob MacArthur and those bonus marches in Washington were more important. Michael Love, here in Chinook with an evangelist group holding revival services in a tent on Route 39, told Sheriff Edward Billings that his niece, Sister Magdalene Love had disappeared from her room in the Chanute Hotel Wednesday night and that a kidnap note had been found. Sheriff Billings declined to comment on the note other than to say that blood stains on the paper might indicate foul play. The sheriff's office is investigating the disappearance of Sister Love. Is that all there is? That's all. Where does it tell anything about me? They didn't even use my picture. I left a lot of pictures with Uncle Mike. Yeah, well, look, never mind about all that. Now, what's this business about bloodstains on the ransom note? Oh, I just thought that would be a good touch. I put my finger to do it. Well, I don't like it. Well, why should you mind? It was my finger, my you're, blood. You're just setting us up for a shooting gallery. I was just making it a better story, that's all. Oh, shut up, you little beast. Can't you do something about that dog? Now, Tippy doesn't mean any harm. He just isn't used to you yet. I'll, I'll put him outside. Now, come on, Tippy. Now, that's a good boy. You just play outside for a while. You darkness. It can't be. It just can't. <laughs> Give your hand to a friend, give your heart to your love, but give your code to contact the sooner the better. Hey, I'm back. How's that cold? Rotten. Get the contact? Oh, I got everything. Contact, cold tablets, and this liquid. Oh, no. 
Honey, it's all cold medicine. Oh, sure, but it only takes one contact for up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezing, drips, congestion. For that, I'd need six of your cold tablets. Two every four hours. Or three ounces of nighttime liquid. One every four hours. Or just one contact. The tiny tide pills do it. Well, it's all cold medicine. Those others contain antipyretic analgesics. The liquid, antitussive, and alcohol. They're not in contact. Six or three or one. I choose the one contact. Me too. And I'm the one with the cold. Here you go. Contact the sooner the better. Six or three or one. When you catch a cold, take contact. Only as directed. The Zero Hour continues after this. Hi, everybody. This is Tony Butala of The Letterman. Medical care for veterans. Who is eligible to receive it? If you're a veteran or related to a veteran, this information may help you look ahead to the day when you can use VA medical care. The VA hospital system is responsible for taking care of veterans who are injured or who became ill while in the service. Their needs always come first. Next are veterans who can't afford to pay for medical care on their own and veterans over age 65 or receiving VA pensions. Today, there are 168 hospitals in the VA system. Some have live-in units allowing veterans to come and go as they please. The VA sometimes makes arrangements with nursing homes for patient care outside the hospital. And VA outpatient clinics provide a full range of services from general medical treatment to dental care or to drug clinics. I couldn't believe it. But it was her, all right. Mrs. Puddleford from down the road. She hadn't come near our place for a year or more. What was she coming now for? Well, there was no time to warn Sister Love. All I could do was try and bluff it out, like I'd done with the deputy about Joe John. Dorcas, girl, how are you? How are you, Mrs. Fuddleford? I'm sweltering in this heat, I can tell you. Yes, it's very warm, isn't it? Oh, warm is hardly the word. It's... Oh... Oh, I, I didn't know you had company, Dorcas. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Puddleford. You come on in. This is my cousin, Mary Kimball from Seattle, Washington. How do you do, Miss Kimball? How do you do? Uh, sorry to bother you, Dorcas, but I, I need to borrow a cup of sugar? Well, of course. I'll get it for you right away. Uh, uh, no hurry. No hurry, dear. It's, it's too hot to hurry. Right, Mrs. Kimball? Yeah. Perhaps Mrs. Puddleford would like a glass of lemonade, Dorcas. That would hit the spot, all right. I'll get you a glass. Oh, thank you, Dorcas. It's mighty neighborly of it. Oh, I'm sorry it's been so long since I've had a chance to call on you. I noticed your pa's gotten himself a new car. Well, that's Joe John's car. He's my cousin. My other cousin, he's from out of state, too. We're having a kind of family reunion. Well, now, that's nice. I always think it's nice when a family can keep in touch. In these hard times, so many families are being split up. Some have to go to look for work one place and some another, and like as not, nobody finds any, any place. Of course, most folks just don't have the money to go flitting all over the country. Oh, goodness. Dorcas, that's not your pa liquored up again, is it? So that's old as Joe John, my other cousin I just told you about. Joe John, this here is Mrs. Puddleford from down the road. Oh, hello, Mrs. Puddleford. I explained how we're having kind of a family reunion, you and Cousin Mary and me. Oh, nice to meet you, Mr. Gimble. Plunkett. My name's Plunkett. Here's your cup of sugar. Oh, yes, yes. I suppose I should be getting back. I imagine you all have family business to discuss. Yes, in fact, we do. <laughs> You've been here a few days longer than Miss Kimball, haven't you, Mr. Plunkett? Uh, yeah, that's right. At my place being right on the road where it is, I can't help noticing people coming and going. Must say, I didn't see when you arrived, though, Miss Kimball. I came by train. And Joe John drove in to pick me up. We didn't get here to the house until quite late at night. Oh, 
Let's see. By the way, Mrs. Puddleford, did you happen to take in that revival meeting they had across the way a few days ago? Oh, no. My church doesn't hold with those offshoot religions. Well, the reason I mentioned it is I just read in the paper that that lady evangelist who ran it got herself kidnapped. You don't say. Why, that sounds like that other one out there in California. Claimed she was kidnapped a few years back. Said some men held her prisoner in Mexico or some such place. But there were a lot of people who thought that was a put-up job just for publicity. <laughs> it was not a fact. Well, I guess it's like they say, everything's been done before, right, Cousin Mary? I wouldn't know. Well, nice meeting you all. Thanks for the sugar dropping. You're welcome, Mrs. Puddleford. You fool! Why did you purposely throw the newspaper story in her face like that? <laughs> so that big grand plot of yours wasn't so original with you after all, was it? I don't know anything about that other case. All I'm concerned about is what if that, that, that busybody recognized me? It would ruin everything. Oh, come on. Now, Sister Love sitting at Dorcas Kimball's kitchen table in a plain cotton dress sipping lemonade. The Lord's handmaiden herself. I'm going upstairs for some peace and quiet. It's true. No one would ever imagine Sister Love in a place like this. I don't understand, Joe Jones. Why did you bring up that newspaper story and everything to Mrs. Puddleford? Well, I knew it would make any difference. I mean, either she knew or she didn't. Mostly, I just wanted to get Sister Love's mind off all that about your pa. My pa? Yeah. When I was bringing Sister Love here in the car, I told... Well, I told her your pa was dead... I just hope she doesn't remember that. What did you talk to about Paul for? You didn't have to tell her anything about that. I just said he was dead, that's all. I didn't tell her anything about your killing him or us burying him. No, Joe John. You didn't. <laughs> Tell them, you know, if you're 18 or older, you can help a lot of guys be prepared by being a leader in scouting. I mean, it, fella, scouting today's a lot more than you think. Be prepared. Are you ready to get Be prepared. Are you ready to take the lead? Because if you ain't going to help, teach us to be prepared. Hey, John, you're leaving the service soon. What are you going to do, huh? Well, I'm not sure, but uh, I know I want a job. Well, the Army trained you in communications, and, and you had that extra training through the Veterans Administration. Right, but if I work nights, I could go to school on the GI Bill and get a math degree, too. Hmm, I'd get the degree. Say, how about me? I'd sure like to get into banking. Think I got a chance? Why not? A lot of banks are hiring veterans, and Uncle Sam can pay you monthly allowances while you're in training. Why don't you talk to the VA people? Hey, I'm hungry. Yeah, me too. How about lunch? Yeah, okay. Don't sound like disabled vets, do they? When it comes to work, they aren't disabled either. They've got training, ambition, eagerness to learn. All they need is a chance. You can give it to them. Contact your Veterans Administration or local state employment service office. Hire the disabled veteran. He's got a lot to give. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense. If two of them are dead, I'm Rod Serling. 
Today's episode brought to you in part by Quaker State Motor Oil and Contact. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here... To the Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by Contact and Ford Motor Company. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. are sometimes hard to keep. Berkus Kimball had one, but let it get away. Joe John Plunkett learned of one, though he tried not to hear. And Sister Magdalene Love needed one. A body furtively buried in the cyclone cellar of an old farmhouse. A deadly secret now shared by three people. Time now for the test of the old adage. Three may keep a secret. If two of them are dead. Our story continues in a moment. Some excuses for not wearing safety belts are only good for cuts and bruises. Some excuses for not wearing safety belts are good for broken arms. Some excuses for not wearing safety belts are good for compound fractures. Some excuses for not wearing safety belts are good for concussion. Some no, I can't do it. I'm going to go home and bathe. 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 I'm going to go well, my father never wears them, so why should I? All excuses for not wearing safety belts are good for nothing. I go over a million miles on an exit. What's your excuse? I didn't know who to be angry with. My pa for being the way he was. Joe Jones for talking to Freddie about it. Or sister love for listening in on other people's business. Sometimes you're going to blame it yourself. Anyway, Mr. Love knew all about what had happened. He didn't waste any time using it to your advantage. So innocent little Dorcas here is a murderer, and you, Joe John, are an accomplice uh, after the fact, as they say. No wonder the two of you weren't shocked by my harmless little kidnap plot. 
Where's all that love and forgiveness you preach when you got that fancy purple robe on? Oh, Dorcas will have to work out her own atonement for her sins. And you for yours, Joe John Plunkett. And what about the uh, Snow White sister love? <laughs> I am still as I always was when my dear mother and father were beside me. I sleep the sleep of the good little girl. <laughs> I well, I told you to keep that dog outside. You can't stay outside all the time. Hi, Skippy. This is Dorcas's house, and that's her dog. Now, seems to me you don't have the right to order either one of them around. I'm paying all the expenses, aren't I? That gives me every right. And we have work to do, so get that mongrel out of here. It's all right, Jojo. Take Tippy back outside now. Come on, Tippy. Come on. Now. I'm not at all happy with the way things are going so far. You mean because you're not hitting the front page headlines? That's not our fault. At least your picture was in today's paper. On page five. Oh, you were right, Joe John. We should send a letter of instructions about the ransom tonight. All right. Go ahead and write, write this. Dear Uncle Micah, I'm being forced to write this note. Mail ransom money at once to the Clay Turner. Clay Turner? The man who was drunk at your meeting that night. That's as good a name as any, isn't it? Now just keep writing. The Clay Turner, General Delivery, Wichita, Kansas. And Mark, please forward on outside of package. What's that for? Tomorrow morning early, I'm going to go down and forward a card to forward any mail for Clay Turner to General Delivery, Chicago. I mean, that ought to send him on a wild goose chase. Uh, I decided it'd be too dangerous for us to try to pick up that package. I mean, it's certainly going to be a dummy for a newspaper anyway. So, look, uh, go ahead. Right, uh, if all goes well, I will be released on receipt of the money. But I don't know where. We have to keep him guessing about where we, <clears throat> where we are. Is that all you want me to write? No, finish it off with, uh, please do as they say, Uncle Micah. They haven't harmed me. And sign it. Well, the thing is where the mail it from. Hmm. Surprise, you don't have that all worked out, too. I got it worked out. It's only about 50 miles or so to the Oklahoma border. Next night, I'll drive over there and just mail it from there somewhere. I have to admit, that sounds like a good idea. Can you ride with me, Joe John? I've never been to Oklahoma. No, I'm only going to be driving as far as the first mailbox I come to, so. You still be Oklahoma. No, Dorcas, I'd rather go by myself. I haven't had much chance to be alone since I've been here. That wasn't exactly true. Ran out of my cot in the workshop. I was alone every night. Long enough to remember everything I wanted to forget. And then finally to fall asleep and dream the whole thing back to life again. I was a boy again, coming home from school. Coming home to the house I knew the best, a pretty little white house with rose bushes. As I came up the walk, I looked up and saw the open window with the white curtain blowing out of it, my mother's window. I walked up the steps across the porch, left the screen door banging behind me, passed my school books on the table, and I called out, Mom! I'm home! Mom! She wasn't there, I figured. Gone to the store or something, so I headed for my room. I was thinking about the things I'd just gotten for my birthday a kite, a new baseball bat, and a toy train. The door to my mother's room was closed, but I heard a sound. I ran under the burning curtain. It sprung in and knocked something over, I thought. So I opened the door, and the whole world went crazy. The room was full of strange stick people just for a while and all talking and words and words that I couldn't understand. Then silence and then the voices again. And somehow I stood in the middle of all of them with my baseball bat in my hand. It was shining and moving. It. it was blood all over. And I just stood there wondering how did I get blood all over my new baseball bat? If you had to 
to a friend. Give your heart to your love, but give your cold affection to contact. Don't just stand around and sniffle. Do something about that cold. Early. To get the relief you want, up to 12 hours of continuous relief from just your sneezing, runny nose, and congestion, you'll need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of nighttime liquid, one every four hours, or only one contact. Figure it out. Six or three or one. Take contact. Get all day, then all night relief. Six or three or one. When you catch a cold, take contact. Only as directed. Contact, number one in the world. We'll return to our story in a moment. <laughs> I'm Roger Staubach. I'm not here to talk to you as quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, but as an ex-serviceman who'd rather have his head beaten in on the football field than practice his skills in another war. And that's why I'm rooting for the world's most successful peacekeeping team, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's worked for nearly a quarter of a century. In that time, the 15 Atlantic nations that make up NATO have been building teamwork like never before. In Europe, Historically, the world's greatest trouble spot, they have helped keep the peace and develop economic cooperation. They have generated a game plan through which problems like arms control and pollution are being attacked. Believe me, it's needed. The world's been kicked around enough. Let's help strengthen the NATO team. NATO works. Something else might not. This message was brought to you by the Atlantic Council of the United States. Tonight I was pretty glad I had to make that long drive across the border and back. I was going to bed trying to sleep, find myself back in that same nightmare I'd lived with for years. But I couldn't take Dorcas with me, even though she was still begging me to when I left. Why can't I go with you, Joe John? Well, because I think one of us ought to stay and keep an eye on Sister Love. Why? Yeah, what's she going to do? Well, I don't know. Thank you. Just keep having this feeling. She's up to something. Who do you want? I know I'm saying this because I thought you could have a good kid. But I'm kind of scared here, Joe Ben. No, there's nothing to be scared of. Yeah. I'm saying I have a feeling that Joe John was my friend. I'm a friend I had, so I'd get this. Well, before I went in and gave people the dish of hamburger scraps I had cooling for them on the side board, I'd go to the workshop, see if there was anything I could do to make Joe John's cot more comfortable. I had a meant to pry. Not really. But when I was sitting in the sheets and blankets, Joe John bundled fell on the floor from somewhere behind the bed, and something fell out of it. A razor in an old leather case. I started to stuff it back, and that's when I saw the letters. From my Mrs. Henry Plunkett. And then I remember that talk between Joe John and Sister Love about Joe John's mother. He got him so mad, and I don't know why. Sister Love seemed to know more about Joe John than I did, and he was my friend, not her. So I just read one of the letters. My dear son, thank you for at least letting me know from time to time where you are. I must assume... That means you want me to continue writing to you whenever I feel able. I have my good days, of course. Bad ones, too, that are better forgotten. But people are good to me here, although it is like poison. Wherever you are, I hope there are people who are good to you, better to you than your own mother, whose sin, justified as I thought it to be, Drove you to the dark violence of that terrible day we both can never forget. Always I write to you over and over the same plea. Forgive. Forgive yourself, my poor boy. And if you ever can, your mother. Church, I'm going to like you and me. Now I have to tell you about my pa. Did that really happen? Don't you hurry up and come back. <laughs> Joe 
Hey, Jimmy. What, what's the matter? What are you doing up? Is something happening? Oh, you're listening, okay. Your sister Laura. Well, she went to bed a long time ago. I have to talk to you, JJ. Talk is late. I got afraid maybe you weren't coming back at all. Yeah, well, I came back. What's the matter with this? What's the matter with this? Listen, JJ, about Pa. I want you to know exactly how it happened, so maybe you won't feel so bad about your part of it. Never mind that. That's what we've done with. After Ma went away and died, Pa took after me sometimes. When he was too mixed up to know what he was doing, I mean, I, I guess he was crazy to land me this small, you know? Mm-hmm. Dorcas, how old are you? And the truth. Well, I want to tell you about that, too. I lied to you. I'm not 17. I was just... Fifteen when I was just there. Go on about your father. Well, like I said... No, I don't mean about that part. How did you kill her? I mean, did you hit him or something, or what'd you do? I pushed him. He went all the strength I could. And he fell. He fell real hard against the bricks. You know, he fell sort of close to the ground. I knelt down with him, and I shook him, and I yelled at him, and he didn't answer me, and then I saw he wasn't breathing anymore. There wasn't even any blood, no blood at all. You pushed him. You, you just, that's all you did? Well, it was enough, wasn't it? He fell down dead, didn't he? But you didn't mean to kill him. I told you I didn't mean to kill him. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry now that it was then. Go ahead and cry, kid. <laughs> You're just a kid. I thought it was, don't you? I shouldn't have made you help me with him like I did either. I'm sorry about that, too. Yeah, sorry. We do things we don't mean to, and we're sorry. And that's the best we can do, I guess. I'm going to bed. I think you better, too. Well, I better take Tiffy out here so she doesn't feel good. Did you eat a supper, okay? Well, I guess so. It's such a nice little. Sister Love? How come? Well, I had a big cooler on the sidewalk when I was outside. And I came in, she told me she couldn't stand away from the sniffing on for it, so she gave it to me. Tip, come on, Tip. Come on, girl, let's go outside. Come on. You act like you can't walk, Joe. What's the matter with you? I don't know. Except I do know one thing. Sister Laura was different. She does things she means to do. And she doesn't know the meaning of the word sorry. The tip is looking real bad. She's been shaking all over. Oh, I do, John. What's happened to him? He's, he's been poisoned. Hello, I'm Hugh Downs. And you are an American consumer. Which means that more and more, you expect advertising to give you facts that can help you make a wise buying decision. That you don't just buy what someone tells you to buy. And that's why, instead of just telling you that the workmanship in the 1974 Ford can stand up to close inspection, Ford is also telling you how to go about inspecting a car. It's all summed up in a booklet called The Closer You Look Book, available to you now at your Ford dealers. And what it is, is a list of checks and inspections that tell you what to look for and how to recognize a well-made automobile. So if you're thinking about buying a new car, Pick up a copy of the Closer You Look book at your Ford dealer. And while you're there, take a good, close look at the new Ford. When you do, Ford thinks you'll agree that this isn't just another car slogan. The quiet Ford. The closer you look, the better we look. The Zero Hour continues after this. <laughs> What about the new Navy? You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. If you think you've got what it takes to make it in the new Navy, call toll-free 800-841-8000 or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. All over the
Maybe it was all I've done since I came here. This big grave. Dorcas was crying over right the grave of the dog when she had over the grave of her father. <laughs> I couldn't blame her for that. What could you ever do anything to anybody except both? What did she do it for, if you're John Why? Well, she hated them, you know that. I should have kept them outside like she asked. Well, it was more than that, and I knew it. Poor Tippy. He'd just been a guinea pig. I was wondering whose grave I'd be digging next before I fell into one myself. I looked over the Dorcas. There she was, just snuggling, rubbing her hand across that bony freckled nose. Just a kid, it turns out. A scrawny, greedy kid. It was written all over that thin face, those long, grasping fingers. But I'd seen the first time I saw her. But she wanted something bad. Wanted something. And she wanted everything with a ribbon around it. And what did she got? A miserable old man and a flea bitten dog. Now both of them were dead. Was she worth saving? I thought of the advice that uh, I once gotten from a hard old boy I met in a pig jail once. Nobody's any good boy. You remember that. Nobody. <laughs> Dorothy's standing in the room by Tippy's grave, the rain was starting to come down. Because I knew that's what she wanted to do. Besides, I was in the mood to have a nice little talk with Sister Love. She was in the parlor, sitting in the back of the stone, being outside the window. For the first time since she came here, she went around one of those plain cotton house dresses she had Dorcas buy for. No, she had on a Flimsy, lavender negligee that obviously was her own. She was playing solitaire. And as soon as I came into the room, I saw that she was cheating. If you throw out the rules, what's the point of the game? What do you mean? The only thing that matters to you, to everybody, except children, fools. No. I was always told never to trust anybody who didn't like dogs. Me, Dorcas. Off somewhere still sniveling over that mangy little mongrel. Took him in a lot to her. No. Animals get sick and die just like people. But why don't you do it? What are you up to? I'm not in the mood for riddles, Joe John. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, then I'll give you some answers. A thousand bucks. You don't have it to pay us, and you never did. Now, so, so what kind of a payoff are you planning for Dorcas and me when this job is over with? Well, you just said you had all the answers. I got the answer to that one. A dose of whatever it was you gave that poor little ham last night, that's the payoff you're really planning for us, now, isn't it? <laughs> you have an active imagination, Joe John. That's so right. Did. That's right, I have. Oh, I can see you playing the big scene now, telling the world how you barely escaped with your life. How you had to kill us before we killed you. And just why, in this fancy logic of yours, would I risk murder? For those front page headlines you've been sweating blood for all your life. Oh, I can see them now. Evangelist kills would-be murderers. Sister Love pleads self-defense. Sister Love acquitted of murder. To speak in Madison Square Garden. Sister Love survives ordeal to save the world from eternal damnation. <laughs> Joe John, I'm afraid you missed your calling in life. You are a born journalist. Sister Love's sarcasm couldn't screen out the fact that I had hit home. So now all the chips were on the table. And I had my choice. Stay and try to help Dorcas. Or get out and save my own skin.
There's a frozen door for you, sir. And you didn't have any in here. I had to turn my way down the steps slowly. And all the time I had a creepy feeling that when I got to the bottom, I was going to fall right over Paul's dead body. Of course, Paul was buried in the ground. Same as Dippy. I felt the soft damp earth of Paul's grave when my feet were stepped back real quick. But the brick stayed cold and dry in my feet. I felt my way along the wall till I found it. The loose brick and behind it, Great Aunt Nadine's beaded purse and the gold coin. My blood froze. For a minute I thought it was my pa calling me from his grave. Lord, you down there? I knew it was Jim Joe. He was coming down the steps. Joe Joe knew about my money. He knew that's what I was down here for. And that's why he was coming down after me. George? I can't see. I could see Joe Joe coming closer. Why couldn't he see me? Maybe my eyes were used to the door. Maybe he was lying. Maybe he could see me and just wanted to catch me off guard. I couldn't trust anyone. I held the purse as tight as I could, and I reached out for anything I could find to stop him. In my free hand, found that loose brick, and I raised it up over my head, and I waited. And I waited for Joe John to take one more step. Listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. Hello, this is William Conrad. If you're planning a trip abroad this year, you'll be returning to the United States through customs. You'll be asked to declare, either orally or in writing, everything you've acquired abroad and have in your possession at the time. Your baggage and belongings will be examined, and during thorough examinations for illegal narcotics, you may experience a slight delay. In order to clear customs more quickly, it's a good idea to keep all sales slips and have them handy when you make your declaration. Also, do your best to pack the articles you've acquired abroad in the same suitcase. Know before you go about customs, rules, and regulations. For free information, contact the U.S. Treasury Department's Bureau of Customs District Office nearest you and ask for customs hints for returning U.S. residents. You will find the customs office listed in your phone book under U.S. Government. Open up! It's me, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of all France, much of the civilized world, and Louisiana if the deal falls through. Quick, Pierre, hide in the closet. Napoleon must not find you here. Come in, Napoleon. Ah, Josephine, I had to see you. Napoleon, my dear Etat, what are you doing here? I thought you were at Waterloo. I was, but it ended early. <laughs> what is that? I smell cigarette smoke. You know I hate you to smoke. I didn't. I don't dare. I mean, I, I started again. Aha! The smoke coming from that closet. Come out of there, you scoundrel. And on cart. You can send me in there to pick up the dry cleaning. Take that, you filthy escargot. This world history lesson was brought to you by your American Cancer Society, which says smoking can be injurious to your health. To say! <laughs> In more ways than one. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study and suspense. If two of them are dead, I'm Ron Serling. Today's episode brought to you in part by Contact and Ford Motor Company. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. been listening to The Zero Hour, 
a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Fleischer and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Stanton Forbes' bizarre retrospective tale of entanglement. If two of them are dead. Starring Earl Holloway. Catherine Burns. And Nina Foch as Sister Love. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by Ford Motor Company, MEM, and Sign Off. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. Depression of the 1930s, a time of hopelessness, a time of fear. Fear, an unfortunate catalyst, one likely to bring more of the same for Dorcas Kimball. Dorcas Kimball. She waits in a dark cyclone cellar, clinging to the only security she has left in the world, a small bag of gold coins. Alone and frightened, ready to strike down Joe John Plunkett, the very man who could be her only hope of escape. The conclusion of If Two of Them Are Dead follows after this word. A professor of psychology revealing the complexities of man's behavior. A student drinking in this knowledge and expanding her world. An attorney guiding a client through legal tangles. What do these people have in common? They were all born with cerebral palsy. And the professor, the student, the attorney, and the messenger, and the clerk as well, have all proven one important thing. They are functioning in spite of their handicaps. When you're born with the brain damage that results in the condition we call cerebral palsy, it takes a lot of determination and courage to surmount that handicap. But that's not all it takes. United Cerebral Palsy is an agency that helps, but not without you. This is Richard Kiley. A lot of people with cerebral palsy will make a better life for themselves because when United Cerebral Palsy asked, you were there. Poor Dorcas. Poor little girl. Ever since I showed up, I've been cursing my own bad luck. Then while I was standing there on the cellar steps, in the pitch dark, it first occurred to me, her luck wasn't all that much to speak of either. Hell, she'd met me, the fight of the 13th of humanity. Brooks? Good morning, you Georgie. You don't come in, so I got me a break and I'll use it on you if I had to. Well, it would serve me right if you did. I should just get the hell out of here while I got the chance. But what do you want, Joe Joe? You answer me before I heed this break. I'm not after that money of yours, if that's what you're thinking. So what'd you come down here after me for? To warn you about Sister Love. 
What about her? I was right about Tippy. She killed him on purpose. She must have some kind of poison, and she put it in Tippy's food last night. What? Just because he barked at her? No, she hated it. But that's not the reason she poisoned it. Why'd you do it then? Because she's got plans. And we just don't figure out. At least not the way she told us we were going to. You mean she's not going to play with that thing? No, she's sure not. It's <laughs> funny. I never really believed it anyway. I mean, it wasn't like my money from Great Aunt Nadine. But I, I knew what it felt like to hold it in my hand, and I could think about it spending it whenever I wanted to. Well, it's not just the money, Dorcas. Sister Love is evil. I mean, she's, she's liable to do anything. Yeah, I know that. She killed Tippy, didn't she? I can't decide if you're my friend or not. You shouldn't count on anybody. Well, that's why I came down here for my money. It's the only thing I got now to pick up. That's why I picked up that brick when I heard you come. Yeah, well, that was smart. But I think you and I just better stick together till we can figure out what to do about Sister Love. But what can we do? I don't know. I don't know yet. But for now, we better get back up to the house. I have to take my money with me. I don't want to have to come down here anymore. Yeah, well, hang on to it. You may need it. Joe John? Yeah? I could have hit you with that ring. I just couldn't have done it. Never mind about that. Come on, let's go. What she said was probably true. She probably couldn't have used that brick. Sister Law sure as hell would have, and I could have too if I'd had to. But Dorcas, no. No, she probably couldn't. And maybe that made her worth saving. Only what could I do to save her? And why not just save Joe John Plunkett? I mean, even an old piece of driftwood has its juices. And who knows, maybe the next jump I made off some freight train might mean good luck. Well, this one had sure been bad luck. Bad luck in spades. Well, there'd been some good luck along the line, I still remember. Like San Angelo, <laughs> Bessie Sproul. First, that had looked like I struck out again, too. Hopping down off that freight to find the only car on the road was this old girl's jalopy. Stopped dead with a tire flutter in my bankroll. Mister, look, look, I know fixing a flat for an old broad like me is something you could live without, uh, but I'll give you a lift into town in exchange. And if you've got the time to spare, you're welcome to take supper with my old man and me. <laughs> I know my way around the kitchen pretty good. That turned out to be an understatement. For the next six weeks, I never ate so good. Turned out, Bessie's old man was laid up with a bum back, and Bessie needed somebody to help her run this miniature golf course until it got better. <laughs> I guess maybe that was the sweetest six weeks of my life. What made me think of it now, I wondered. Bessie Sproul and her old man in San Angelo were a long way from Sister Love fixing a pitcher of lemonade in Dorcas Kimball's kitchen. And that was a question to put my mind to when I got inside the house. Now, why had Sister Love turned domestic all of a sudden? She didn't know her way around the kitchen, as far as I knew. Maybe little Tippy knew better. And I thought some about that. Lemonade, huh? Amen. Looking for a car that's easy on gas, easy to buy, and yet has the luxury you want in a car? Look what we've done to our Mustang. Look what we've done to that car. Oh, we changed the size, we changed the size. Like it fine, so look what we've done to that car. 
Mustang II. It's the all-new economical car from Ford. The right car at the right time. Built even smaller than the original Mustang. It has an easy on the gas four-cylinder engine, rack and pinion steering, tachometer, four-speed transmission, plus a beautifully appointed interior. All standard. Luxury plus economy. That's Mustang II. When you take the ride, Mustang 2, $28.95, excluding dealer prep, destination charges, title, and taxes. See your local Ford dealer. We'll return to our story in a moment. You're 17, 18. You've graduated from high school. You want to make something of yourself. But you don't have that something to make it with, like money for four years of college. What do you do? Well, you don't need four years of college to get a good job. Today, there's a crying need for technicians in exciting fields like oceanography, electronic data processing, health service, environmental control, forestry, and many others. Technicians earn twice the salary of the average high school graduate. Some even make more than four-year college graduates. All you need is a year or two of technical training to learn how you can become a technician Send for our free booklet. It's called 25 Technical Careers. Write Careers, Washington, D.C., 20202. If you can't afford four years of college, write Careers, Washington, D.C., 20202, and make something of yourself. It was spooky the way the two of them just sort of stared at each other without talking. She kept stirring the lemonade, and he just looked at her, right at her. And not like he was thinking she was real beautiful, either. You keep stirring that, you're going to wear that spoon off. I was thirsty, and I wasn't going to wait forever. Whatever you and Dorcas were doing outside took you long enough. Dorcas, you better go get out of those wet clothes. She's been standing out by Tippy's grave in the rain. Sentimental foolishness over a dog. Well, it's done. Except for the sugar. We can all have some in a moment. I didn't dare take my eyes off Sister Laura's hands. I watched her spoon the sugar into the pitcher, stir the mixture, and then take three clean glasses out of the cupboard. Two of them, I felt sure, were going to end up containing something a little more potent than lemonade. The rain's stopping. I'm glad. Tippy never liked being out in the rain. Oh, God. Can't you forget that dog? I'll never forget that dog. Here, I'll, uh, I'll pull the lemonade. No, it, it isn't quite chilled enough. I'll just set it in the icebox for now. We'll have it a little later. Guess I will go change my clothes after all. We'll wait for you. You come right back. Uh, listen, Dorcas wants out of the deal. What? A thousand dollars. I don't know. Well, I mean, whether you got it or not, Dorcas doesn't want any part of it. Why are you telling me this? Why doesn't Dorcas tell me herself? Well, she's afraid of you. Afraid of me? Yeah, I, I know. That seems unbelievable to you, but she's just a child, you know. Oh, 17 isn't exactly a child. 15. She just admitted it to me. Have you been filling her with some of those wild notions of yours about me? Uh, look, she's got a little money she saved. She's been, well, she's kept it hidden for years. Now, she wants to take it and leave, so let's let her go, huh? I want to hear this all from Dorcas herself. All right, here she comes. You asked. Well, Dorcas, Joe John's been telling me some very interesting things about you. What things? What have you been telling her, Joe John? You still got your money safe on you, have you? My money? Joe John, why would you tell her about that? That's all right. Sister Love understands. Now, I explained to her now that Tippy's gone, so you just want to take your money and go away. Oh, no, but I... Sister Love doesn't object. Now, do you, Sister Love? Well, no, of course not. But where are you going, child, if you leave here? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Joe John's right. I want to go away. Any place. Very well. Joe John can drive you wherever you want to go. But let's have our lemonade first, shall we? Now, she was going to let us go, so it would look as though we were on the run when she played her big rescue scene. But first, of course, the poison. The three glasses were still on the table where she'd set them. 
Sister Love lifted the pitcher and began to pour the lemonade. I deliberately turned my back on her. I have to wash my hands. Grave digging's dirty business. You didn't have to help me, Barry Tipia. Could have done it by myself. Oh, yeah? By yourself, huh? You fall too, I suppose. Well, I was scared then. I, I could do it now. I'm not scared anymore. You'll always be a scared little kid. That, I, no matter how old you get. God, that's not fair, Joe. John, you got no call to say I that. I say that. Now you're bawling again. <laughs> Listen, you better dry up if you want me to take any place. Now, let's all calm down with a nice, cooling drink. Here you are, Dorcas. I'm sure Joe John didn't mean what he said. Three seemingly civilized people sipping lemonade on a muggy summer afternoon. Now, what could be more innocent? I watched as Sister Love and Dorcas tipped their glasses to their mouths and drained them. I smiled, raised mine, and a little toast to them, and then I did the same. I'm ready. You're not going to take anything with you? There's nothing here I want. Well, come on, then. Goodbye, Sister Love. And just be glad that you're not ever going to heaven. Because Tippy's there, and he'd only bark at you. <laughs> well, looks like I was wrong. She's not a scared little kid anymore. Oh, by the way, you won't be leaving before too soon, will you, sister? Not likely. Oh, well, that's good. You see, Joe John Plunkett's beginning to believe good sister love. And I sure wouldn't want you to miss it. I'm Santa Claus's wife. Who do you think keeps Santa cozy warm on those long winter nights? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? But what do you give the greatest gift-giving guru of all time? Well, I found out Santa just loves English leather. And English leather has so much grooming stuff, I rarely repeat a gift. So this Christmas, make sure all your Santas wear English leather. Or nothing at all. Sinus flares up. Sometimes your whole face aches. When you need occasional help, get Sinoff tablets, the sinus medicine. Sinoff works with a full dose of pure aspirin for sinus headache, plus a sinus drainer for congestion. That's how Sinoff helps sinus pain while you drain. Remember, for best relief and safety, take Sinoff only as directed. S I N E O F S. The sinus medicine in the bright red box. The Zero Hour continues after this. Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau. You know, there's no such thing as instant shade from a tree you buy through the mail. It takes a large truck and a crane to move a tree big enough to provide immediate shade. But that doesn't mean that mail-order trees are bad. In fact, if you're planning for the future and have a few years to wait, buying young trees through the mail may be a good idea. But before you buy, compare the tree offered in an ad with one you could buy locally. Find out just how big the tree actually is and how fast it will really grow and if it will thrive in your soil and climate. Compare the cost of ordering through the mail with buying locally. And remember, your best assurance of satisfaction, whether you buy shade trees by mail or locally, is to deal with companies who have established reputations for satisfactory dealings. As always... Buy what you want, but know what you're buying. Don't look for shade under a tree that's shorter than you are. A consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. You'd think the kid would ask where I was taking I mean, even if I didn't have the answer. Well, I guess it doesn't matter to her. Just so long as it's away from here. Well, that's the way I figured, too. I could see the house getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. A wooden Uncle Sam in the yard and one arm raised in a farewell salute. The miniature painted windmills marching away into the distance reminded me of something, another time, another place. 
of Sweet Six Weeks in St. Angelo. Yeah. Bessie Spool and her old man in a miniature golf course. Something Bessie had once said to me was struggling to come up for air. In my mind, now, what was it? It was one of those soft summer nights. There were a few players still on the course. A couple of young lovers on about the ninth hole. Oh, they weren't in any hurry to finish their game. And a large laughing family group just coming up on the 18th. I was the one with the miniature windmill that you had to hit the ball through. Kind of a little fairyland it is, where people come to be together and be happy. Yeah, yeah. That's what it looks like, all right. That little brook running through it and those little elves' houses, all those twinkling lights. <laughs> a magic kingdom with my old man and me as the king and queen. <laughs> Everybody in the kingdom acting as carefree as children. You know something, Bessie? I've even felt carefree here. It's been real nice having you, Joe John. Sort of like having a son. That's the one thing we miss. It would have been nice having some kids of our own. Yeah, but I guess it just wasn't in the cards. Suddenly, I knew why Bessie Spruill and San Angelo kept popping into my mind. What are we stopping for? There's a phone booth there. I want to make a call. Who to? Never mind. I'll be right back. He went to the phone booth to make a call, like he said. I thought maybe I should try and get away while I had the chance. But I couldn't drive the car. Anyway, taking the key. But trying to get away on foot just didn't make sense. He could catch me too easy. But I, I didn't know where to go. So I just sat there in the car and waited like he told me to. Well, you're in, kid. You got a maid. What are you talking about? You got your money with you, haven't you? You know I have. You got enough for a one-way ticket to St. Angelo? Yeah, it's plenty. Well, where am I going to go in San Angelo? <laughs> to the Magic Kingdom, right? Huh? I live with the King and Queen. You're going to like Bessie and her old man, Dorcas. And the place they live, too. Hey, it's even got a windmill in the front yard like you used to. Well, it sounds okay. Well, everybody's happy there, huh? Even I was. Then why aren't you coming too, Joe John? Well, never mind about me. I just gonna do what I have to do, that's all. I don't understand. Then I never have understood you very much. Yeah, well. People can't always understand each other, Dorcas. Oh, you're gonna have to be getting aboard. Maybe you can come along later. Look, kid, if I can ever make it to St. Angelo, I'll be there, okay? Okay. Well, you got your ticket and your address? I got it. Now, you keep your money hid safe while you're on the train, you hear? Oh, I will. Don't worry. <laughs> I guess I don't have to worry about that. Joe, Joe, you never did answer me. Do you think I'm ugly? I mean, sister love isn't beautiful like you thought. Oh, no, Dorcas. <laughs> no, you're not ugly. Well, my leg does I know that. Your leg? I keep forgetting about that. You do? All I know is... You got the damnedest green eyes I ever saw. Well, it was done, man. Dorcas was saved. Some words from a book I'd read one time came into my head. It is a far, far better thing. Hell, I don't know what they meant, but I sure felt good, I'll tell you that. I felt better than I'd felt in a long, long time. Like a big weight had just been lifted off my back. Sister Laura was still in the kitchen where she was when we left her. Standing at the sink now, draining the glass. It was a glass of water, I was pretty sure of that. My own throat felt like I'd been wandering in the desert for days. That's the trouble with lemonade. It makes you thirsty. What did you do? Well, you might say I turned the tables on you. But switch the glasses would be more accurate. Hallelujah, sister. But you couldn't have. 
I went to the sink to wash my hands so that I could watch you in the shaving mirror. I saw you slip a powder into two of those glasses. Oh, you weren't easy to distract. But I managed with my little play actor with Dorcas, remember? Only she wasn't play acting. But why? Because you and I have one thing in common. We'll both be better dead than alive. You and I? You and I. That's cozy, isn't it? And Dorcas, why did you do with her? Well, she's out of it. I sent her away to the safest, sanest place I could think of. She's going to have a chance now anyway. You fool. If you switch glasses, why Dorcas's? Why didn't you save yourself? Oh, I wouldn't be a noble if that's what you're thinking. But you still wouldn't understand. I only understand what you've done. Destroyed everything. Not just for me. For everybody. <laughs> All those millions of souls denied Sister Love's salvation, huh? Yes. Sinners don't want to be saved. That's straight from the horse's mouth, lady. Fool. What did, what did you use? Ergot. That stuff women take to bring on the miscarriage. It's easy to get. So what happens now? I don't know exactly. Well, we just give a little wine and fall in our graves like Tippy, huh? Sometimes see things before. Are you seeing things? My mother and father, that old bus driving down that mountain road. Only Uncle Mac and I are with them. We're, we're sitting in the back. The bus is going fast. You too better, fast. You better warn them. It's going to crash. I'm trying to, but they're not paying any attention. They're just laughing and singing. Why don't you just sing along with them, sister? I can't. I don't know the song. <laughs> You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. Hello, folks. This is Lawrence Welk. You can state it in a number of ways. The more you learn, the more you earn. The more you know, the higher you go. The better the scholar, the greater the dollar. It all adds up to one thing. You need a good education if you are to get to keep the good job you want. So this is to urge all you veterans, look into the educational opportunities offered by the GI Bill. You can finish high school, you can go to college, you can go to trade school, you can get on-job training. You get paid while you're in school or training, but the best part is you earn more later on. CVA Today. Did you say God? Well, I know Him by everything you say and do. Did you say God? Well, I've seen Him every time I look at you. Religion in American Life. That concludes this week's production of the Zero Hour. Stanton Forbes, If Two of Them Are Dead. Next week, we'll begin another exciting dramatization of a tale of mystery and suspense. We'll tell our story in five days, at the same time, Monday through Friday. So, on Monday, rest your eyes and listen here to the Zero Hour. I'm Rod Serling. Today's episode brought to you in part by Ford Motor Company, MEM, and Sinoff. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio.
have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater. Heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in Monday and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to the Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.